Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this really special program about the uh, about chocolate, the perfect indulgence. We all know that. We don't need to be taught that. But we also want to know why. So we're really excited to have you here. My name is Mina Jane, and I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library. And um, I would like to tell you that we are recording this program and that you can put your questions in the Q&A. And Mike will be following that along, and I'll be keeping a track of it as well. Um, I would like to thank the Cary Library Foundation, which supports all of our adult programming. And, um, and we could not do this stuff without them, all of this fun stuff. So we appreciate them. Um, during Mike's presentation, if you could keep your, um, your videos off, that would be really helpful. So you, would, you wouldn't be along the side or along the bottom of it. So um, do that at any time. Um, okay, so Mike Cross is the department chair of natural sciences at Northern Essex Community College where he teaches chemistry and forensic science. He believes that education should be fun and exciting. Who doesn't? <laughs> and he enjoys incorporating demonstrations and magic tricks into his teaching. So you know we're gonna have some fun tonight. Mike holds a PhD in organic, <laughs> organic chemistry. I can't even say that straight. From the University of Utah where he specializes in oxidative lesions in DNA and RNA. Um, fortunately, he's talking chocolate today, so we don't have to worry about figuring out what that means. <laughs> Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for being here. Perfect. Thank you for having me. Hopefully that um, sounds all good and everything, but um, awesome. So yeah, so it's nice to be here. And we will talk a little bit about DNA, um, my specialty, but I won't get into too much. I'll try not to give me any flashbacks to uh, organic chemistry. But I'd appreciate um, that. <laughs> Awesome. And, and as Mina mentioned, I, I love questions. So if you have any, please feel free to put them in the chat. I might not notice it because I get excited. I just keep talking, but Mina can interrupt me at any point and, uh, you know, and get your questions answered. So you're probably here because you're a chocoholic and, you know, I know I am. Uh, I know that I love dark chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate, anything. But growing up, I was always told that chocolate is bad for you, right? That it rots your teeth, it makes you gain weight and so forth. And um, that's definitely one side of the issue, right? It's like a dollar bill. Um, the other side of the issue is something that we hear about nowadays, which is that chocolate's great for you, right? It's a superfood. It, it has all these, um, these antioxidants and so forth. And so my job tonight is not to try to um, convince you that chocolate is one thing or the other. My job is hopefully to convince you that really this is all just part of the same issue, right? You ever try to spend these $2 bills at Market Basket? They don't think they're real. You actually have to, uh, to break it back up into $1 bills before they'll accept it. So that's like chocolate, right? It's this idea that chocolate has two sides, a good and a bad, a dark side and a light side, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to my screen now. And in a second, you should be able to see that. Okay, perfect. And Let's see, there we go. All right, so we're gonna talk about why chocolate is truly the, the perfect indulgence. So first off, um, up there in the top right-hand corner, that's a cocoa pod. Um, it's about the shape of a football and it has um, about 20 to 30 cocoa beans in it. Um, it's filled with this fleshy white fruit and then the, the cocoa beans. And these cocoa pods grow on a tree, the cocoa tree. The Latin name is Theobroma cacao, which literally means food of the gods. So someone knew what they were talking about when they named this. And we've been using cocoa for, for many, many years. In fact, the earliest recorded use we have of cocoa goes back to about 1900 BC with the Olmec and the Makaya tribes of Central and South America. But they weren't using cocoa in the same way that that we do today, right? No Hershey Kisses, no Cadbury Cream Eggs. Instead, they would actually brew a drink out of it, which sounds kind of nice, right? A um, little bit of hot cocoa, but a few differences. One is that the, they brewed it cold. The second is they didn't have sugar. And so instead of using sugar, they would actually add things like chili powder to it. So imagine hot cocoa that's cold and tastes like a jalapeno. And that would be the drink that, that they were drinking back then. So a little later, the Maya came along and they um, also used cocoa. 
In fact, they are interesting because they're the first people that we have recorded that used cocoa beans as currency. They're actually um, records that archaeologists, paleontologists, or not paleontologists, anthropologists, I guess, that have found um, these records. They found that for three cocoa beans, you could exchange that for uh, an avocado, make some guacamole. For 200, you could get a turkey, which I always thought was a really great deal until I moved to New Hampshire and found out the turkeys just naturally pop out of the ground. I mean, they're just everywhere. I go out in my front yard and there they are, right? Um, now I should probably just grab turkeys and exchange them for cocoa beans. But the Maya were also interesting because they, they, they believe that chocolate um, was an aphrodisiac. They believe that it represented life and fertility. And so every marriage ceremony um, would involve cocoa, which sounds kind of nice. Um, they, the lucky bride and groom would exchange cocoa pods. It's a symbol of fertility. They would also drink from the same ceremonial cup of cocoa which is kind of a nice tradition, right? Better than my reception, I got like 13 toasters. <laughs> Having some chocolate there sounds a bit better. So a little later, about 1200 AD, um, the Aztecs came along and conquered everybody. And they also loved chocolate. In fact, they demanded cocoa beans as tribute, as taxes from the people that they had conquered. Um, they also were interesting because they used all of the cocoa bean, right? In fact, they would even press out the, the fat, the cocoa butter, and they would spread that on their skin as a way to protect their skin, which is interesting because nowadays, all the fancy skin creams that my wife buys always say enriched with cocoa butter. You could just grab a bar of white chocolate and just rub it all over you, get the same effect. Just watch out for fire ants, I guess. So after the Aztecs, um, how did we go from that to the cocoa that we love today? Well, um, Columbus and Cortez and others, you know, quote unquote, discovered the new world. And while they were here, they found people drinking cocoa and they thought, well, I bet the king and queen would love this. They took it back to Spain and no one was really impressed with it. They thought, why would anyone drink this bitter, spicy drink until someone had the brilliant idea to leave out the chili powder and instead add things like vanilla and sugar and once it became a sweet treat, it was all the rage. Everyone wanted in on, on chocolate, on cocoa. Um, it became part of royal dowries. It was, it was literally everywhere. But even back then, they were still drinking this. It wasn't until a bit later in 1847 that the first chocolate bar was invented. And it was dark chocolate for all you dark chocolate fans out there. Um, 1875, milk chocolate came along. And then in 1930, Nestle invented white chocolate. So um, now uh, the bad news, I should get that out of the way first. White chocolate is not technically chocolate at all because it contains no cocoa powder. Um, it's made from just the cocoa butter, the fat from the, the cocoa beans. Um, but without cocoa in it, uh, it's not truly considered chocolate. But um, many people still love it. I included, I love white chocolate. But when I talk about the health benefits of chocolate, it's primarily dark chocolate, to a lesser extent, milk chocolate, and unfortunately not white chocolate. But if, you know, at the end of the night, you decide you need to get rid of all your white chocolate, let me know. I'm sure I can find, you know, a good home for it. <laughs> so um, the next thing is chocolate has become part of our culture. It's in our movies, our books, right, Willy Wonka. Um, it's actually been part of our war efforts. Uh, Hershey's was actually given the Army Navy E Production Award several times during World War II. They actually made about three billion D ration bars, little um, uh, chocolate bars that were placed into every soldier's emergency ration kit. Now that sounds pretty nice, but unfortunately they didn't want the chocolate to taste very good, right? Um, and they didn't want it to melt. So they had to specially formulate it so that it wouldn't melt. And they tried to make it taste about the same as a boiled potato, according to the records. So imagine chocolate that doesn't melt and tastes like a potato. And that would be, <laughs> that would be the, the emergency ration bars. Um, chocolate has also been on every Russian and American space voyage in history, which is pretty impressive considering it costs about $10,000 to take a pound of stuff into space. So those are some very expensive M&Ms uh, floating around down there. But you can see by the astronauts look on his face, totally worth it. Chocolate's also amazing because it invented the microwave. <laughs> kind of interesting with a little help from an engineer named Percy Spencer, 
who was working at Raytheon and like many of us carries around a chocolate bar in his shirt pocket. And as he walked in front of the magnetrons that they were using for, um, for radar, they, he found that the chocolate bar melted. And his first thought was probably, oh man, I need a new shirt. But his second thought was maybe I could use this to cook food. And lo and behold, the first microwave, the radar range was born. So chocolate was the first accidentally cooked microwave food. The first intentionally cooked microwave food was popcorn, believe it or not, which worked great. The second one they purposely tried was cooking an egg, <laughs> which was a bad idea. Um, it just exploded all over the place. So next time you cook in a microwave, you can thank chocolate. So pop quiz time. Normally I'd have people raise hands um, for this, but um, you can just answer it for yourself. Who do you think eats more chocolate, men or women? So most people would say women and they'd be correct, <laughs> but just barely. Among American adults, about 92% of women admit to eating chocolate regularly, about 87% of men. So not a big difference. Now, what about country-wise? Which country do you think eats the most chocolate? So usually when I give this presentation, people say the US, right? Which um, we're actually number 10, we're way down there. So hopefully you brought some chocolate to this presentation so you can up our numbers a bit. Um, but turns out that the number one chocolate consuming country is Switzerland. And if you've had Swiss chocolate, you know why. Um, they're the home of Nestle and Lindt. Um, so a pretty amazing chocolate comes out of Switzerland, Germany, way up there. Um, but yeah, here in the US, we're actually number 10. Um, Switzerland actually eats about twice as much chocolate per person than we do. And we're no slouches. I mean, the average adult eats about 11 pounds of chocolate a year, which, I mean, that's about a pound a month. So that's quite a bit, but in Switzerland, they eat about twice that much. Now, if you're thinking, wow, a pound a month, that's, you know, that's a lot of chocolate. That's too much. Um, that's why it's an average, right? Some people are thinking that's not enough chocolate. <laughs> All right. So why is it that we love chocolate so much, right? This looks a lot like my wife after a long day with the kids, right? I get home from work and she says, just set down the chocolate, put the kids in bed. No one gets hurt, right? So why is it that we love chocolate? Well, couple of main reasons. One is that chocolate contains a lot of sugar, right? And we're genetically programmed to seek after sweets because um, sweets contain calories, which keep us alive. So it makes sense that we would continue to eat sweets like chocolate. Also, anytime we eat sweets, including chocolate, it triggers the production of endorphins, these um, feel good chemicals that are pumped out in our brain that make us feel great. And we like to feel good. So we continue to eat more chocolate. But both of these things are true of any sweets. So why is it that many of us would gladly sit down and eat an entire bar of chocolate, but sitting down with a bowl full of sugar and a spoon just doesn't sound very good. It makes my teeth hurt just thinking about it. So there may be some chemical um, reasons for this, some biochemical rationale for why we crave chocolate so much. So before I do, let me ask, um, when it comes to chocolate and holidays, what do you think of, right? Um, the vast majority of people think Valentine's Day, right? I mean, there's other holidays, Christmas, um, Halloween, Easter with chocolate bunnies, right? Arbor Day, Tuesdays, right? There are a lot of good holidays that we need to celebrate with chocolate. But um, the number one day that I'm specifically told to come home with chocolate or not bother coming home at all is Valentine's Day, right? So why is it? I mean, why is it that we associate chocolate and romance? I mean, there are books on this, right? Eat chocolate naked and 142 other ways to attract attention and spark romance. Much better than the sequel, Cook Bacon Naked. It's a bad idea, <laughs> just skip that one. But um, we might think, well, it's clever marketing, right? That we're told in commercials that we should give chocolate to people we love, so we do it. And maybe that's part of it. But remember that even going back to the Aztecs and the Maya, they also believed that chocolate had aphrodisiac properties and they believed it symbolized life and fertility. So it's not just commercials, right? They didn't have TV back then. So what is it? Well, there are a couple of chemicals that may be responsible for this. And this is where uh, Mina may have some flashbacks to OCHEM, but uh, I apologize for the chemical structure. They make my heart go pitter patter just a little bit. So I had to put them Killing in there. Killing me, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, that first chemical there, that's called tryptophan, right? So um, this is a chemical that is the raw material for serotonin. Serotonin gives us feelings of elation and ecstasy. Serotonin is pumped out in our brains when we're in love with someone, right? So um, when we get the kind of that warm, happy glow when we're in love with someone, that's the serotonin that's uh, being produced in our brain. And so it makes sense that if we want to, uh, you know, have someone fall in love with us, then we should be able to give them chocolate, right? And the tryptophan should trigger that. Um, but turns out that you've probably heard of tryptophan before as well, right? Uh, we just had Thanksgiving and every Thanksgiving, well, not this one because I didn't go anywhere, but usually gather with my, my family, um, extended family, and they, um, we all sit around and we eat this wonderful turkey dinner and then we all fall asleep right on the couch. And my younger sister always says, oh, that's the turkey coma. That's the tryptophan in turkey that's making you sleepy. And that's actually an urban legend. I mean, turkey does have tryptophan in it, but so does chocolate. Um, ground beef has a ton of tryptophan in it. And yet no one ever says, oh, I ate that double cheeseburger and I'm just out for the count, right? Um, the reason that we fall asleep after Thanksgiving is we just ate far too much of a carbohydrate rich uh, meal and our brain's trying, uh, our body's trying to digest that, right? Divert some blood from the brain to, to our stomach. Um, so if tryptophan is the only reason that we associate chocolate with romance, um, I should be able to show up next Valentine's Day with, you know, a dozen red roses and half a pound of lean ground beef. And uh, it doesn't work, believe me. So, <laughs> so there must be something else besides the tryptophan. And that other chemical may be this one right here, PEA, phenylethylamine. So PEA is a chemical that's also found in chocolate, but is also produced in our brain. Um, actually, when we're first attracted to someone, when we kind of get that jittery, excited feeling, can't wait to, to you know, for six o'clock to roll around, they get off work and we can go on a date. So that's the PEA that's, that's being pumped out in our brains. So again, chocolate contains high amounts of both of these, right? And so it makes sense that when we, when we want someone to fall in love with us, we give them chocolate, right? Hopefully these chemicals then trigger some of these emotions in their brain. And then we swoop in and say, see how you feel? That's me, right? <laughs> and then, um, I mean, don't knock it. It definitely works. I, I gave my wife chocolate on our second date and about two and a half months later, she asked me to marry her. And we've been together 18 and a half years since then. So it seems to work. I just keep bringing home chocolate and she doesn't leave. So it's a good sign. <laughs> The secret but, of true love. <laughs> yep, exactly. Lots of chocolate and forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> so these chemicals are great. Now, obviously, they're not in such high quantities that if you crack open a Hershey's bar in the checkout line that you're going to fall in love with the cashier. There's obviously more to it than just that, but it certainly can't hurt, right? Now, there is another chemical that's found in chocolate that I just want to, uh, to mention, and this one's called anandamide. This one comes from the Sanskrit word for bliss, and it's what's responsible for runner's high. So if you know people who love to run marathons and things like that, apparently as you're exercising for you know, long periods of time, it's supposed to feel really good. I don't know if I believe that, it's never happened to me, but apparently at some point it's supposed to feel really good. And that's because your brain starts producing anandamide. That anandamide hits a receptor, that receptor suddenly triggers this euphoria, this kind of, you know, just wonderful feeling. And then you keep running that marathon. So chocolate also can, contains anandamide. So it does trigger a bit of this kind of euphoric, good feeling. Now, um, that anandamide is also um, interesting because that receptor that's looking for anandamide can also be overexcited by a different chemical called THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana. And so every now and then you'll read an article in a newspaper or magazine that has some sensational headline that chocolate's the same as marijuana. And the rationale for that, I mean, it's not true, but the, the rationale is because of this chemical anandamide. So again, your brain is naturally looking for anandamide, like the stuff found in chocolate, but THC, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, can also um, overstimulate that. Most experts say you'd probably have to eat about 20 pounds of chocolate in one sitting to get the same effect as you know, smoking marijuana. So if you're eating 20 pounds of chocolate in one sitting, you have other issues. I don't know, that's even a bit too much for me. So 
hopefully now we kind of understand why we love chocolate so much. Um, and I apologize, I can't actually see the chat um, here. So Mina, feel free to chime in if anyone um, is putting some questions in there. Not but, yet. We're just having a really great conversation about uh, answering your questions and what's better, U.S. or uh, European chocolates. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I personally am a big fan of uh, German chocolate, uh, Swiss chocolate, I think is pretty amazing. But um, I will not turn down any chocolate. So. <laughs> but it is interesting that there are definitely differences. I have a friend from Argentina, and um, I remember he, he got some Argentine chocolate, and he's like, he gave it to me. I tasted it. It was good, but it was very grainy. And I commented on it and he said, yeah, that's how chocolate's supposed to be. So oftentimes we just kind of get used to whatever we're used to. We just think that's what chocolate should be like. But chocolates, that love affair we have with chocolate's not such a bad thing. Um, there are quite a few reasons to feel good about eating chocolate. And the main one is um, these chemicals called flavanols. And these flavanols are very potent antioxidants. The idea behind an antioxidant is that it, um, it helps to um, block or destroy free radicals, right? So free radicals are these kind, kind of like little chemical terrorists that get into our cells and they will react with anything they can find. And if that happens to be our DNA, then that causes damage to our DNA, which if not repaired can lead to cancer. So the idea is that if we flood our cells with antioxidants, then those antioxidants will preferentially bind with the, with the free radicals, which destroys the free radical and keeps our DNA nice and healthy. So um, this chart here shows a bunch of different foods that are very high in flavanols and other antioxidants. They have very high ORAC values, oxygen radical absorbance capacity. Basically, the higher the value, the better these are at fighting off um, you know, DNA damaging free radicals. So you can see top of the list there, we have black plums, very, very, very high in, um, in flavanols. But if you eat too many black plums, you have, other, have other issues. So we'll move on to the second one, which is dark chocolate. So you can see also extremely high in these antioxidants. Um, next on the list, we have other really darkly colored uh, fruits like blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. Artichokes somehow got in there. Um, I'm not sure how, but uh, I've now put artichoke hearts on my pizza and my wife can't get mad at me because it's a health food. Um, <laughs> if we keep moving down the line, we hit things like strawberries, cherries, and eventually down there near the bottom, we see milk chocolate, right? So still it has a decent amount of flavanols, so these antioxidants in it, about the same as grapefruit juice, but only about one third what you'd get in a good bar of dark chocolate. So um, if you're trying to eat chocolate for health reasons, then um, you want dark chocolate. Or as a wise woman once told me, just eat three times as much milk chocolate and you get the same effect, right? <laughs> I should I'll give a little uh, disclaimer here that um, when, my, when I got my PhD in organic chemistry, my wife started telling people that her husband was a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. So just be aware of that. Take all you know, medical advice with a grain of salt here. Um, <laughs> that if, yeah, um, chocolate does have some good reasons, but moderation and all things. All right, so um, turns out that these flavanols are, are also good for other things besides just blocking free radicals. They also have been found to stimulate nitric oxide production, which helps to open up blood vessels. It's actually been shown, chocolate's been shown to lower blood pressure. In fact, there was an Italian study where they took two groups of men with high blood pressure and with the test group, they, they gave them 100 grams of dark chocolate a day. Now, 100 grams, that's, that's like a full lint bar. That's the kind of study I need to sign up for. And they found that after only two weeks, the test group had lowered their blood, pre lowered their blood pressure significantly. So um, that's pretty good, right? Um, they've also found that chocolate helps to lower cholesterol. I should say cocoa in particular, right? The higher the cocoa content in your chocolate, the better it will be at doing all these things. But... Um, lowers cholesterol, um, also may have some mild anti-blood clotting properties, but wait, there's more. It's like the ShamWow commercial. There's just more and more, right? So they've also found that eating cocoa um, helps to prevent or lower the risk of diabetes. Uh, it helps to fight insulin resistance, which is kind of the preliminary stage of diabetes. Um, second, they found, or another thing they found is that because it opens up blood vessels, 
that it helps improve blood flow to different areas, um, may re reduce the risk of stroke. They found that eating chocolate regularly actually improves vision, which is kind of surprising because of increased blood flow to the cornea. Now, I can't, I can't lose my glasses, right? It's not going to suddenly give me 20-20 vision, but I figure every little bit helps. Um, they've also found that students who are given chocolate before exams actually do better on exams. Now, there are two thoughts behind this, right? I can imagine the study where they take a bunch of third graders um, in a big gymnasium and they tell one group, okay, you guys get chocolate before you take your uh, MCAS test or whatever, and the, the other half, you get nothing. And it's hard to fill out that bubble sheet, you know, through all those tiers. So it makes sense. But the actual real reason they believe that that chocolate helps to um, improve student performance on exams is that chocolate, the cocoa, improves blood flow to the brain, which probably helps to increase recall. And then um, dark chocolate, people who eat dark chocolate, um, it actually reduces cravings for sweet, salty, and fatty foods. Probably because you just ate a bunch of dark chocolate, right? So why do you need anything else? But um, in my mind, I know I'm going to indulge in something, right? I'm not just going to eat broccoli and Brussels sprouts every day, all day. And so if I'm going to indulge in something, my motto is it might as well be something like chocolate that has some benefits, right, that go along with it. And then it turns out that there are some other benefits. Um, chocolate actually um, offers sun protection. So next time you're at the beach, a little Hershey syrup all over yourself now. <laughs> um, they've actually found that, that people who regularly consume dark chocolate actually sunburn more slowly than those who don't. They believe it's due to all of those flavanols, those antioxidants that are now flooding your cells, which can help to prevent some of the damage done by sunlight, by that ultraviolet radiation. Chocolate also contains a chemical called theobromine, which is a natural cough suppressant. Um, some of the, the all natural cough drops you can buy nowadays uh, will actually have theobromine as the active ingredient. And you could literally just be sucking on a square of dark chocolate and get the exact same effect. And I personally think it tastes better than cough drops. Now, the downside to theobromine is it is toxic to pretty much all other species. So dogs, cats, you know, walruses should not be eating chocolate. Um, dogs especially, a cat would like nibble on a Hershey kiss, right? But a dog would eat the Hershey kiss and the bag and the sofa cushion it's sitting on. And so um, dogs are typically the ones that are in danger of theobromine poisoning from chocolate. It builds up in their liver, they can't detox it and they can die from it. So um, be careful, right? And the darker the chocolate, the more dangerous it is to dogs because it has higher levels of theobromine in it. And I mentioned that um, chocolate helps to increase serotonin production, which has been shown to lift depression. And chocolate contains a host of essential minerals. So that's pretty good, right? That's uh, quite a few benefits from our humble bar of chocolate. But um, there's a downside, right? So dark side to dark chocolate. If you don't want to hear about the bad side, you can just plug your ears at this point and just go on our merry way believing that chocolate's perfect. Um, <laughs> but it turns out that chocolate does have a dark side, um, and that's really the calorie, particularly the fat content that's in that chocolate. Now, the great thing about it, though, the good news on this is that chocolate contains three types of fat, um, oleic, stearic, and palmitic acid. And... Um, it's about a one-third, one-third, one-third mix of each of these fats in a good quality bar of dark chocolate. Oleic I, acid. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Is the palmitic acid from palm oil? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that's your palm kernel oil. That's the nasty stuff. That's the one that ups your heart disease risk, um, your bad cholesterol, things like that. Oleic acid is the one that's found in olive oil, which is a healthy fat. So your, our doctors are always saying cook with olive oil bam, you can just cook with uh, chocolate instead. Right? <laughs> it's like if you've ever had um, mole, it's that Mexican dish or a chicken with like a chocolate sauce on it. It sounds horrible, but it tastes delicious. Um, the second one, that middle one is stearic acid. That's a monounsaturated fat, but it's been shown to actually have a neutral effect on heart disease risk. So what that means is that one third of the chocolate, uh, one third of the fat in chocolate is good for you. One third of it's neutral and one third of it's bad for you. So in my book, that's a wash, right? <laughs> it should just cancel out. You still have to worry about calories and all of that, but at least it does have some, some healthy fats in it. So 
how do we eat responsibly, like the commercials say, right? So as I mentioned, moderation in all things, right? Um, the, uh, I mentioned that that one Italian study had the, the subjects eating 100 grams of dark chocolate a day. Most studies have found that the sweet spot, pardon the pun, is about 30 grams a day. So 30 grams, that's about, um, you know, two or three squares of lint chocolate. That's about five Hershey kisses or about three Dove chocolates. So that kind of gives you a feel for about how much um, they recommend. So that's still a pretty decent amount. What I personally eating, also, oh, go ahead. About, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. What about eating fat-free chocolate? Is it still the problem with the calories? Oh, good question. Yeah. So um, you can get things like fat-free and sugar-free chocolate. Um, you'll find that, oh, well, let me first back up. The, the um, cocoa content's the same. So that's great. You'll still get all of those health benefits. And then you are leaving out a lot of the, you know, the sugar and the fats. Um, so that's not a bad, a bad approach to it. Um, downside is things like the artificial sweeteners that they use in like sugar-free chocolate, um, those can have some other side effects, right? They're oftentimes diuretics. Um, people can get um, you know, problems with that. Um, let's see. But other than that, yeah, not a, not a bad thing. Um, one woman I talked to, what she would do is actually take cocoa powder, like baking cocoa, and then just mix that in with something like Greek yogurt in the morning. So that way you're getting all the benefits of the um, the cocoa without any of the drawbacks of added sugar and fats and things like that. So there are other options, you know, especially if you're diabetic or, you know, are just really trying to watch your fat content uh, or fat intake, I should say. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. But yeah, I mean, 30, 30 grams a day, you're talking probably about a hundred, 150 calories. Um, so not a huge amount. I figure I can swing that somewhere in my diet and you know, balance those calories out. So if I'm going to add in 100, 100 calories of chocolate, I should probably cut those out somewhere else. Maybe not eat a piece of bread or something. <laughs> eat one less piece of toast in the morning. Um, and then if you're going for maximum health benefits, you definitely want to eat um, you know, as dark as possible of chocolate, right? Because that will help to um, give you all the benefits of the cocoa powder with less of the drawbacks of, you know, the, the sugar and so forth. Now, how do you know what the, the you know, how dark is dark enough? Well, um, it really depends on personal preference, right? I, I mean, I've seen chocolate bars that go up to like 99% cocoa. I mean, to me, that's too strong. It tastes like eating baking cocoa or just eating a spoonful of baking of cocoa powder. That's too bitter for me. And I, I personally believe that you should be enjoying the chocolate that you're eating. It shouldn't be like, oh, I have to take my cod liver oil and now I've got to eat my spoonful of uh, dark chocolate. Um, but what I found is that you can adjust to, to higher concentrations of cocoa. Like I grew up only liking white and milk chocolate. I couldn't stand dark chocolate. But my wife who um, you know, spent uh, some time living in Germany, she got me hooked on good like Swiss and German chocolate and she would slowly up the cocoa content. And after a while, I didn't even notice, right? You know, I, I was eating, I actually now prefer 70%. That's kind of my perfect chocolate. Um, most bars will tell you on the label, you know, what the cocoa solids percentage is. Many of them are very proud to tell you right on the front. It'll say like 72% twilight dark Ghirardelli's chocolate, right? Because they want you to know. Otherwise, it'll tell you on the back, typically, um, you'll flip it over and it will say, um, you know, 42% cocoa solids, something along those lines. I have a question. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> when did the, the chocolate company start making them like that, where there's different levels of cocoa? Was it scientific? Like, did they say, oh, this is better for you, so we want this, but we also want to have this option for more sugar? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if they did it just because of, you know, kind of a health benefit idea, or if it really is just a taste thing. I mean, some people really do like very, very strong, rich, you know, dark chocolate or bittersweet chocolate. Um, it's probably a combination of both. I'm guessing that they probably originally had different, a few different levels, just to, you know, please everybody. And then 
once people started to really kind of get this cocoa fad of wanting more cocoa, then I think they started to um, proudly broadcast exactly how much they have and start offering like different amounts. Um, I know in Stratum, New Hampshire, they have a, a lint factory and a factory outlet as well. I, I, I love going up there and just seeing all the different types of chocolate that you can get and, you know, testing out different ones. It's kind of mm -hmm. nice. Um, there's also a couple of, yeah, oh, in the, ahead. in the chat, we have a couple of book recommendations and a recipe and Paulette says that she buys a hundred percent bars from Trader Joe's. Okay. So they yeah, are think, local too. Yeah. And I think they sell them in like one pound blocks too, which <laughs> that's some good chocolate right there. Is that for so, yeah. like eating or is that more for like cooking though or baking? Uh, I, I would personally use it more for baking or cooking. I mean, that's too strong for me to just eat it, but um, I guess you could. I mean, the other option is I've, I know some people will shave it and then put it, you know, in the hot milk or something, mm -hmm. you know, and have some hot cocoa that way. Yep. So that's a good option as well. There's also a difference in um, countries, like country of origin. So in the U.S., for instance, um, in order to legally label something as chocolate, they have to have 11% cocoa solids in it. So if it's um, less than that, then they have to label it as chocolatey or chocolate flavored. So if you see something that says like chocolate flavored pretzels, it's because that pseudo chocolate they're putting on the outside doesn't meet the legal requirement. It doesn't have enough cocoa in it. Um, in, in the UK, the minimum is 21%. So oftentimes people prefer, you know, uh, European chocolate, you know, for one reason, because it has, you know, simply more cocoa in it um, on average. Another difference is how they, they cook it. So in, in Europe, they typically won't cook the milk quite as long. Actually, sorry, no, switch that. In the US, they won't cook it quite as long. So it typically gives the chocolate a bit sweeter of a flavor. In Europe, they'll cook it a bit longer, almost till it burns. And then you get a bit more of kind of that, like, I don't know, burnt toast flavor to it, like almost a more bitter kind of strong flavor to the chocolate, which some people really like and other people don't. So. Um, let's see. The next thing go is go back that, to your comment about the lint factory. Um, uh -huh. is, is that like the lint factory recipe that from, from Europe or is that, is, is there a change to it because it's in the U S Oh, good question. Yeah. So do they change the recipe? I believe they still use the original lint recipe. So it is um, more of the European style. Um, okay. The company, Lint and Sprugly, they actually own Ghirardelli's as well. They bought them out in about 1998, I believe. And so, um, you know, if you're eating Ghirardelli's chocolate because you think that it's, you know, like a homegrown thing, it kind of is. I mean, it was based in San Francisco, but it's now owned by a Swiss company. Um, but actually, I believe the, I think it was a few years ago, that the factory up in Stratum, New Hampshire, they now have a whole production line in that factory just for Ghirardelli's chocolate. Because I was told that they, um, they found that 70% of the Ghirardelli's chocolate they were making in San Francisco, they were shipping to the East Coast. And so they realized, why not just make it on the East Coast and then they don't have to ship it as far. So um, kind of a interesting little thing. So they do still use for the Ghirardelli's chocolate, they do use the, um, the old San Francisco recipe. So it will still have that same flavor, um, mm -hmm. but it's a different recipe than their lint chocolate. <clears throat> Margaret says that she had to get up and go to her refrigerator to get a second Dove dark chocolate bite. <laughs> <laughs> I am That's also good. craving a chocolate bite. <laughs> I know, just looking at that picture right there, I'm like, wow. <laughs> And I should mention that keeping in the refrigerator is not a bad idea. Um, putting in the, in the fridge is good because it keeps it cool without being too cold. Keeping it in a um, freezer, not such a good idea um, because if you lower the temperature too much, you can actually get what's called bloom. You get kind of this white crystal and stuff um, on the outside of the chocolate. Some people think that's freezer burn or that it's mold or something. It's not, it's called bloom. It's that you've cooled the chocolate so much that the sugar has actually started to crystallize out of it. It's not harmful. It's still perfectly edible. Uh, a chocolate connoisseur would, would say, take it away. I cannot gaze upon it because it now um, changes the texture a bit, makes it a little grainier. Um, 
Unfortunately, there's no way to get that bloom back into it without actually just melting down the chocolate and having some fondue, which, you know, still works great. Um, I remember once I, I found a, I usually would go to Stratum, pick up like $100 of chocolate and hide it in my closet, um, and then, <laughs> you know, to hide it from my kids. And then I'd pull out a few squares, you know, each night for me and my wife. And I remember once uh, one of the bars somehow fell behind something in the so I, I found a few months later this, this uh, bar of bittersweet chocolate, but it had definite bloom on it just because of age. And so I just melted it down in the microwave. I threw in some craisins because I thought that sounded kind of good. And then I proceeded to eat the entire bowl of it. My wife said, you just realized you ate an entire like lint bar of chocolate. And unfortunately, when it's melted, you don't realize how much you're eating. So <laughs> you have to be a little more careful with it. Have you ever had um, the... Um those chocolate eggs, a Kinder Uber Ashun. Oh yeah. Yeah. The chocolate Those are nice. is, yeah. I mean, the chocolate's not that great, but you continue with your presentation. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah. Those Kinder eggs are great. They're actually um, illegal in the U S um, I heard that they're the uh, number one um, most uh, what it's called contraband item at Logan airport. Um, <laughs> so you have to get slightly different ones that don't have the egg inside of the chocolate egg. All right. So the, the next thing that, that happens with chocolate, if you're eating it for health benefits is that you should actually avoid eating a lot of dairy, um, at the same time that you're eating the chocolate. So, and that really seems to go against, um, everything that I've been talking about, right? I mean, even growing up, I would have a, a, a some chocolate chip cookies and a cup of milk, right? A glass of milk or a double fudge brownie and a scoop of vanilla ice cream. It just seems like milk and chocolate just go together so naturally. But it turns out that the milk protein, the casein, has actually been shown to slow the absorption of um, those flavanols, those antioxidants into our cells. And so you're consuming the same amount of flavanols, but you're only absorbing about 85% of what you normally would. So you are missing out on about 15% of the flavanols um, if you drink or eat dairy products while you're eating your chocolate. Um, is that enough to really worry about? Probably not. I mean, if you really love a, a cup of you know, hot milk with, uh, with chocolate in it, just put in a little extra chocolate to make up for, for the difference. But um, if you're trying to go for maximum health benefits, then yeah, you should um, eat your chocolate and then wait half an hour before you, you know, eat a lot of dairy products. All right, so um, time for a little chocolate quiz. And I don't know if I actually covered all of these. So it's just like my chemistry class. I hope you did the reading before you came in today, but they're all true or false. So we'll just look at each one. So um, the first one I kind of touched on, but I think I didn't actually mention this um, about whether chocolate's high in caffeine. So this one, a lot of people will tell you it's true. In fact, even if you go to the Coca-Cola website with their caffeine estimator, and they'll say, how much chocolate do you eat? And you'll put in an amount and they'll tell you that it contains you know, X amount of caffeine. Turns out that this is false. Um, chocolate actually is very, very low or has virtually no caffeine in it at all. So why is it that we believe this, this myth? It's because many of the early studies um, didn't differentiate between two chemical cousins, caffeine and theobromine. And remember I mentioned theobromine is that natural cough suppressant, which helps to uh, um, you know, suppress coughs. It's toxic to other species, but um, it is the chemical cousin of caffeine. Just a few atoms different, but in organic chemistry, a few atoms is a, a big difference, right? So um, chocolate really contains virtually no caffeine. A whole lint bar, for instance, has less caffeine than a cup of decaf coffee. So um, this is why many people could have chocolate before bed, but they can't have a cup of coffee. Second um, thing here is, does chocolate cause acne? And I have uh, two teenage daughters. They're always worried about breakouts. So should they stop eating chocolate? Well, it turns out this one's false as well, that um, geeks like me have been studying this for 50 years and they've never found any correlation between chocolate and breakouts. Um, breakouts are usually just the result of hormones. And so when my, when my daughters have a breakout, I say, you know what, just have some chocolate. It'll go away. Eventually things will be better. Um, so 
it is possible to be allergic to chocolate, in which case you could get hives and things like that, but that's not the same as, as pimples. Um, in fact, I, I met one woman at a presentation who told me that um, she's so allergic to chocolate that when she eats it, she gets blisters in her mouth and in her throat. And I said, I'm so sorry. And she said, I still eat it anyway. <laughs> so that's, that's hardcore chocoholism right there. All right, what about this one? The chocolate causes migraines. We get a lot of debate about this one, um, but this one's also false. They've, they've uh, been doing a lot of studies on this. Um, they even took migraine sufferers who claimed to be very sensitive to chocolate and they fed them, you know, like, uh, you know, they, they took these, these uh, people, they fed half of them just um, placebo pills. The other half, they filled these pills with um, cocoa. And they found that as long as people didn't know what they were eating, there was no difference in the duration, severity, or, um, you know, or frequency of migraines. So why is it that we often link the two? Well, the thought behind this is that um, chocolate cravings are often triggered by hormonal changes and stress. And migraines are often triggered by hormonal changes and stress. And so you're under a lot of stress, um, you crave a bar of chocolate, you end up eating the chocolate, an hour later you get a migraine and you think, oh, it's because I ate that chocolate. No, it's, they're both symptoms of the same thing. It's the stress level that's causing both the chocolate craving and the migraine. All right, and then the last one is, does chocolate cause hyperactivity? And this one's also false. This one blew my mind. Um, I was always told growing up that, that um, sweets, you know, chocolate, anything with sugar in it makes you hyper. And as I did some research, I found that um, doctors and researchers have literally done hundreds of studies um, trying to link the two, and there's no correlation. Um, so why is it that we think that chocolate or any sugar thing makes kids hyper? It actually goes back to a diet craze back in the 1960s where they um, were trying to get people to eat no sugar. And they started telling people that sugar will make your kids hyper. People believed it. And so we've been teaching our kids this. So they, there's actually a couple of interesting things going on here. One is that if kids believe that sugar makes them hyper, they'll get hyper. Um, they, they took um, classrooms full of kids and um, before like their big Halloween party, they taught half of the, the classes that um, chocolate and sweets don't make you hyper. The other half, they didn't say anything to them. And then they monitored the kids' activity levels. And the ones who were told that sugar doesn't make you hyper didn't get hyper. And those who thought that chocolate makes you hyper or that sugar makes you hyper did in fact get hyper. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The other side of this is that um, parents believe this, and so they watch for it, and they make it happen. So in another really interesting study, they took um, parents of young children, they took the kids into this back room, and then they told half of the parents that their kids were being fed a bunch of sweets. The other parents were told their kids were given a glass of water. They then brought all the parents and kids into this big playroom together, and they said, okay, just go ahead and play for an hour and we'll check in with you at the end of that hour. And at the end of the hour, they gave all of the parents a detailed questionnaire on um, their kids' hyperactivity level, disobedience, things like that. And without fail, all of the quote unquote sugar parents were told that, or you know, rated their kids as much higher on you know, every scale of hyperactivity, disobedience, things like that. And yet none of the kids had actually been given anything and so it was actually the um, and, uh, it was actually the parents thinking that their kids would get hyper, so they watched for it. And then, sure enough, their kids eventually, just like all kids do, start to misbehave, and so they blamed it on the chocolate, on the sugar. The other part of that study is the researchers were actually watching the the parents through a two-way mirror, and they found that the sugar parents actually raised their voices more often. They hovered more. They actually were, you know, like spent more time close to their kids um, because they were looking for misbehavior and then they saw it. Whereas the other parents weren't looking for it. And so they sat back and, you know, chatted with the other parents. And so it really is that we're, you know, we expect it. And so um, <laughs> we see it. The other thing with chocolate, uh, chocolate and sweets and hyperactivity is that 
think about when kids eat sweets. They eat them around holidays and at parties and things like that. Events where it naturally makes you hyper, right? And so it's not so much the sweets, it's literally just the, the event itself that's causing this hyperactivity. Mike, do those, so, um, do those facts and studies apply to all different kinds of chocolate, both dark and milk? Yes, yeah, so, so all kinds of chocolate would be the same thing. Okay, thank you. Yep, no problem. So just to, to finish up, hopefully you've got some chocolate near at hand. <laughs> but if you um, are interested in how to, to truly you know, taste chocolate, this is what the, the gourmet people, the foodies will tell you. My wife loves these kind of shows, right? Um, I will admit that this is not how I eat chocolate. By step three, I've already gone back for seconds. But if you want to truly indulge all of your senses, this is what the experts will tell you. They'll first tell you that chocolate should be at room temperature. And I do agree with that, even though I will typically um, keep my chocolate like in the fridge during the summer to keep it cool. I'll pull it out maybe half an hour before I eat it, just because I like the, the mouth feel, right? One of the, the most enjoyable things about chocolate is that it melts just above um, room temperature, but below body temperature. So you pop it in your mouth and it instantly starts to melt. Um, you also get more of the flavors and smells, aromas, if it's at room temperature. The second thing is they recommend that you focus and clear your palate, um, you know, so that you can really indulge your senses. And then you're supposed to look at the chocolate, gaze at it lovingly to indulge your sense of sight. Um, next, they recommend that you snap it, right? So that you can listen as it, it breaks and then rub a little on your fingers and smell it. And then, um, you know, kind of feel it in your mouth and, you know, just really enjoy the taste. And I do agree with the idea kind of in number six of mindful eating, of just slowing down because as we've all probably experienced, if you're busy doing something and you're just snacking on a bag of M&Ms or Hershey Kisses or something, before you know it, you've eaten the whole bag and you're still hungry because your brain hasn't picked up on those signals to feel satiated, to feel full. Whereas if you kind of slow down and really think about what you're doing and enjoy it, um, I find at least that I don't need as much chocolate, right? I can. Go I can eat two or three squares and really enjoy it rather than um, eating a whole bag um, and just not even really enjoying it at all. All right, so hopefully you're enjoying some chocolate. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the, I'll stop the share right here. And all right, go back to my video real quick. Okay, perfect. So. Um, any other questions, comments that I can answer? Well, we do have a comment from D that says Tootsie Rolls, you microwave them in for a few seconds and eat with a banana. They're excellent. Oh, that does sound good. That but sounds really rolls, good, actually. Are Tootsie Rolls real chocolate? Um, they do have some cocoa in it. Probably not enough um, that it's legally considered chocolate. Um, a lot of sugar, things like that. But Kind of that idea of like a chocolate taffy does sound kind of good mixed with the banana. <laughs> I'm curious about the, a little bit further back, you had spoken about um, chocolate flavored things like, you know, chocolate covered pretzels and there's just flavored. Um, what, it, I mean, what's in those that, that makes it not actual chocolate, just flavored? Yeah, so what they're doing is they're putting in a small amount of cocoa, right? Um, but then they're diluting it out with a lot of other things. In fact, a lot of those, um, they'll take out the cocoa butter uh, because it's expensive and they can sell it to a skincare manufacturer, a skin cream manufacturer, and they'll instead uh, substitute things like partially hydrogenated vegetable oil for it. So if you look at the back of your chocolate bar and it says... Um, you know, hydrogenated vegetable oil, things like that, that's a sign that it's not quality chocolate. A good bar of chocolate really should say cocoa powder, cocoa butter, you know, sugar, um, and then any flavors that you like in there, right? If you like having walnuts in there or orange slices or whatever, then that's fine. But if you see other things, it's probably not good. Uh, actually, there is one more thing that's often in there um, that's not bad. Soya lecithin, it's a, an emulsifier. It makes it nice and smooth. So other than those things, if you're seeing things like vegetable oil, it's probably not good chocolate. Mm -hmm. I also heard once long ago that Hershey's, um, when it was imported from maybe Belgium, I'm not sure where, was uh, baked incorrectly, made incorrectly. But oh, good question. 
Is that true? But they kept up with it. It's why I don't like Hershey, but I may be wrong. Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know the original story. I, I, Have you I don't heard think it? they, well, I haven't heard that they, that they made it incorrectly, but what I do know is that um, Hershey, one of his kind of innovations, which is, I don't think is a particularly good one, is that he was worried about spoilage, right? Because in Europe, it's a pretty small place and it's easy to ship chocolate all over. But in the U.S., they were trying to ship from coast to coast, right, from Hershey, Pennsylvania to San Francisco or wherever. And so one of the tricks that he did is he actually pre-spoiled the chocolate a little bit. He actually would put in a little bit of what we call butanoic acid or butyric acid um, into the chocolate. And that prevented spoilage, but butyric acid... Um, is what's responsible for the taste of rancid butter or the smell of rancid butter. Um, that's why, like if, uh, um, like for instance, my wife's family, they're all from Germany and they they won't eat Hershey's chocolate because they think it tastes almost like a, a little bit of, I don't want to gross anyone out, but like a vomit flavor. And that's actually the butyric acid that gives it like a sour flavor to it, like a sour milk flavor. Prevents the spoilage, but it kind of, I, I don't think it tastes as good. I'll still eat it if there's nothing else, but I prefer other brands. Right. Thank you. Uh-huh. So um, I since I read somewhere that the reason it is so difficult to make synthetic chocolate is that there are over 300 components in chocolate. Is that true? Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things where they can synthesize each individual compound, but synthesizing hundreds of things and putting it together, it just doesn't have the same effect. So, yeah, and th there is some worry about this because um, we are supposedly in a bit of a chocolate shortage um, due to climate change and things like that. The area in which they're growing chocolate, mainly Africa, um, is becoming too hot. And so um, we're getting a little less, we're producing, you know, lower amounts of cocoa. The big thing that we're, that's causing the chocolate shortage is that um, Asia, China, um, historically, they haven't been interested in chocolate but because Westernization, suddenly they're becoming more interested in chocolate. And so now we're splitting our chocolate among a whole lot more people. So it is getting a little more expensive. Not enough that I would, you know, recommend stockpiling massive, you know, chocolate bars or anything like that. But um, it, it probably will continue to go up in price a bit. I wish we were live in the library, in which case Mina would have to be passing out chocolate bars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We'd all be enjoying it. <laughs> I'd be happy to do that. Uh, yes. Um, we have, this is an interesting comment. Uh, Tony's Chocolonely is available in states about four to five dollars a big bar and quite good and even better is made without slave labor. Oh, that is a very big issue right now. So, um, one of the yeah one of the major issues with with chocolate is sourcing the cocoa. Um, so unfortunately, because a lot of it is um, sourced from Africa, um, there's it's known that there's slave labor and child labor that's involved in a lot of cocoa production. Um, the big companies, you know, Hershey's, Lint, you know, Ghirardelli, you know, all, all the major companies, they're just too big. They don't know where they're getting their cocoa from because they buy it from a distributor who buys it from you know a hundred different plantations. There's no one who's going out and checking each of those plantations to see, you know, where it's coming from, right? If child or slave labor is being used for it. Um, there are some, some companies, yeah, um, Tony's uh, Tasa Chocolates, um, smaller companies that are able to go and source it. So they will go and literally check for themselves to make sure that there are fair labor practices in play for the, the cocoa production. Unfortunately, you do pay a premium for that, right? Because it's expensive. And so you will be paying a bit more for it. But if it's important to you, then yeah, um, look into the, the company and find out if they, if they source their chocolate. They're generally very proud to tell you. So it should be right there on the label if it's you know, fair trade chocolate, if it's you know, grown using ethical procedures and things like that. Mm -hmm. I saw a wonderful video once where they handed out chocolate bars to farmers who were growing cocoa and had <laughs> never tasted it. Yeah. <laughs> and they were yeah. out of their minds with delight. It does blow my mind that you could spend your whole life, you know, working one of these cocoa plantations and never 
tasting it, never knowing yeah. like, why do people want this? <laughs> because the beans themselves are edible, but I mean, I've eaten a cocoa bean before. It's, it's very bitter, right? So yeah, unless you're actually eating the chocolate itself, why would you eat it? <laughs> right. So we're about out of time, but, and we don't have any other questions. Is there any last bits of advice you'd like for us when we're going out to the stores to pick up our chocolate? Oh yeah. Um, buy some for me, number one. <laughs> but also, yeah, I would say, you know, look into it. If, you know, whatever matters most to you is, you know, I think is fair. If you're interested in, in looking for fair labor practices, check for bars that have that. If you're interested in the health benefits, look for um, dark chocolate and make sure that it doesn't have things like partially hydrogenated vegetable oils in it. If you are interested in, um, you know, just variety, there are a lot of different uh, chocolate varieties out there. Um, you know, one of my favorites is Lint makes a sea salt um, chocolate. And I just love that salty, sweet combo. Um, they make things like passion fruit mixed into it or pomegranates. And so there are a lot of options and I'd say try it out. I mean, holidays are a great time to, you know, to give chocolate, to receive chocolate and to share some, you know, like fun new ones and make some new traditions. Oh, well, that is really good advice. And I do like trying different kinds of chocolate. Although I once had one that had some weird fruit in it. I was not a, <laughs> not a fan. Yeah. Every now and then you get one where it's like, oh, I'll pass on that one. Right. Or when they don't have the, uh, the map inside and you're like, what? <laughs> oh, right. It's a mystery which one you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. But it is really interesting to know all of the different benefits and things that we need to watch out for. So thank you so yes. much for this. And thank you everybody for coming and for your wonderful questions. And um, I hope you all have a, a huge pile of chocolate to have now because I know I'm in the mood. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm going to get another one of my little dub bars. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> good night, everybody. All right. Thank good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.